This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Guys, therapy has helped many of my friends and family. There is no need to feel bad or ashamed about going to therapy. Getting help is a part of the journey, and that's what BetterHelp does. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help you. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work. Or you just have a lot on your plate. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. Right now is a special offer to my listeners, Lay Your Brick listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash LYBCADE. That's betterhelp.com slash LYBCADE. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Guys, welcome back to another episode of Lay Your Brick. This week, we have Tasha Sizemore back on the podcast. We talk about her early childhood of being shielded from the truth to being exposed to a mentally unstable household and how she's using all that she has learned to motivate her for her future. I hope you guys enjoy and let's get into it. Did you like photography when you were younger? Oh, yeah. Did you ever shoot when you were younger? I didn't get a camera until... I was, I think I was 12 or 13. No, I think I was 13. And when I got my first camera, but um, that was like, after I grew up with like very, very little money in my close family. So I got to get a phone in middle school and it had like a crappy camera on it, but I could take some photos and I could only hold like, I think it was 16 photos on my phone. And it was like one of those like slide phones with the camera. And so I took like all 16 photos and then I would beg my mom to buy me a new SIM card so I could just put in a new SIM card and keep taking more photos. So I was like, and I was, even before I had a phone, I was stealing her phone, my mom's phone to go out and take pictures as much as I could. So it was like, honestly, as soon as I learned how to hold a phone and like I learned what pictures were and like seeing those and stuff, on TV and all the magazines with the fancy, you know, pictures of the beaches and stuff on Maui. I loved, but I loved photography so much. See, that's a funny thing too. So for the people that do not know and didn't listen to the first uh, podcast that I had with Tasha, uh, she's from Hawaii. I am from Hawaii. Which like. Some new tattoos to prove. Ooh. But um, yeah, I am lived there for about 10 years i wasn't born there but i was flown and grown instead of born and raised flown and grown too that i have it's kind of cheesy but i like it so i got it um but yeah i moved there at a very young age went to grade school and everything all the way up and then moved to idaho for high school so so here so let's talk about that so where were you originally born then and what what age did you move I was born in Sacramento, California, um, and honestly, we lived, we didn't live only in Sacramento when I was there, from what I understand. Um, My sister and my parents told me that we kind of, like, lived all over the place in Northern California. Um, My parents separated when I was, like, one or two, I want to say. I was very, very little. I was a baby. Um, So... They separated and my dad moved to Maui when I was super young. And then shortly after my mom moved my sister and I out there as well, because we wanted to grow up with our dad present in our lives. Um, So we moved out there probably when I was five, I think. Okay. Before I turned five. Um, And then, yeah, it was, it was, kind of a hurricane, honestly. Just my parents are crazy people. Um, I don't speak to my mom anymore because she made some decisions that I consider unforgivable. Unforgivable, excuse me. Um, And so she's not in my life anymore. And I don't think she ever will be, which is really sad. But 
if she wants to, you know, not try and take any accountability for the actions that she chose to make, then that's not my fault. So um, yeah, sadly, but my dad is pretty cool. Um, we have our ups and downs for sure, but we're still in contact. He still lives on the island. Um, but yeah, growing up, it was really rough. They were friends one day and enemies the next. We were constantly being ripped away from my dad. So it was brutal. But um, uh, once we started kind of getting older, my sister graduated high school and I um, had just finished eighth grade. And it was that summer that my sister and my mom were like brutally fighting. Um, my sister ended up leaving and saying that she wanted to live with my dad because she was 18 at that point. So she said, screw you, I'm done, I'm gone. Um, moved in with my dad and my mom decided that, you know, Maui was just a toxic place for us at that point. Um, we didn't really have any resources left to help us out. We were really struggling and we just wanted a fresh start. So we had some friends up here who I currently live with. They are like my dearest family pretty much. Um, and they helped us out. They gave us foundation to move out here right before I started, high, literally two weeks before I started high school, mm -hmm. uh, where I met Cade here. And um, yeah, it was, it was honestly for the first year or two, I think that we lived here, it was great. I loved it. Like my mom and I were really doing well in our relationship together. Um, and yeah, I was struggling in school in the beginning, but towards my junior year, I think I really found myself. But um, my stepdad, stepdad, they, my parents weren't actually, or they weren't actually married, but um, we just refer to him as my stepdad because it, he was in my life for probably 12 years. And um, not by choice, unfortunately, because this man is disgusting. And I hope I never have to come face to face with him ever again. Um, but basically he ended up moving out here from the island to be with my mom. And my mom said that it was out of nowhere and he just showed up and all this stuff, but somehow he had our address, he had all this stuff. So it was really weird, um, really fishy, really sketchy. And I had just gotten off of soccer practice and my uncle who I now live with was giving me a ride home. And he had come to the house because my mom had said that there was a visitor there and like was being really weird about it. And I just didn't feel good about it. And something in the back of my mind like told me he was there. So I asked my uncle to come in just in case. And turns out he's there. So I immediately turned to my uncle. I'm like, hey, can I stay with you for a little bit? <laughs> he was like, yep, sure. So I stayed with my uncle for like a week, I think, after that. I was enraged. I was so mad because we had moved so far and started everything over just for him to be here again. So that was heartbreaking. And that does have a part of the reason why we don't talk anymore. So, yeah. Okay. So, so just, cause I think I'm a little confused here. So did, you said your mom did, I didn't think your mom moved to Maui, but she did with you guys. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, my mom was with us. Um, she moved us out there and we actually, all four of us lived together with my dad in an apartment, a super tiny apartment for like uh, a couple months. And then my mom got a job and we got our own place out there. And then it was like, but they were split up started. That's when it was just like, okay, I have my own foundation. Now you're not going to be able to see the kids because you're fucking crazy. Excuse my, but, but oh, yeah, you can, you can swear. <laughs> okay. But yeah. So basically, um, yeah, they were just fighting nonstop constantly. My mom ended up, my stepdad, who I keep referring to, was actually one of my dad's closest friends when he first moved to the island, mm. uh, who he had lived with to get started on his feet when he moved there. So, yeah, for my mom to go around and end up dating this guy for the piece of shit that he was is for so long and just, like, put up with it. Ugh. 
so 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 what was your childhood like then because obviously now you're looking back at it and you're you're understanding that there are certain like attributes and challenges that you overcame and you notice now but back then how was it i mean were you constantly in a kind of like a state of survival or was it more of like you didn't really understand why they were fighting and this and that. And you thought maybe, you know, a lot of, I mean, I don't want to put this on you, but like a lot of kids think that it's like them. Right. So like you and your sister, I mean, were you guys close? What was all that relationship like? Yeah. So um, my sister was basically like my life raft. She basically helped me get through everything. She basically raised me, sculpted me into the person I am today. I mean, um, when you hang out with my sister and I, you pretty much can see that we're the same exact person. It's really funny. But um, her and I were extremely close. And she, in the beginning, did a very amazing job of covering everything up as best as she could, if that makes sense. So basically, I remember um, times where we were like leaving, we were packing bags because our mom was coming to pick us up from my dad's house and we weren't going to be able to see my dad for a long time. So we had to pack like extra things that we wanted to bring. And so my sister would just try and come up with like excuses like, oh, we're going to go camping over the weekend. So make sure you pack like some extra stuff. And she would just try and find like little ways to like cover things up for me. So that way I wasn't seeing the heartbreaking, sad part of it um, that they were fighting and that things weren't okay and that we were going through a really rough time. Interesting. But, yeah. Um, but as I got older, like in middle school, I think that's when I really, you know, started opening my eyes, especially because I was getting older and I was going out and hanging out with my own friends and, you know, going over to their houses all the time and just seeing how their families were um, really woke me up to like, wow, <laughs> this is not normal. My family is very different. And maybe this isn't the type of thing that I should like talk about all the time. Cause I would talk about certain things or mention like a fight that my parents had that resulted in the cops at my house one night. And my friends would look at me like, holy crap. Like what mm -hmm. you have the cops at your house over the weekend. Like that's insane. I'm like, that's like every other weekend. That's how my life is because everything is just so insane because my dad, um, he's bipolar and he had a trouble, like he had a big str struggle for a long time trying to take his medication for it, just to try and keep him kind of, you know, centered and balanced. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was because he didn't believe they worked. He thought they made him worse and all this stuff. But when we were younger, my dad was very, very verbally abusive to my sister. And, um, not to me more so, I think because I was the youngest and he kind of was, you know, like, I'm gonna, you know, baby you, protect you. But he was more so like towards my sister. He was like, you're old enough to understand what this is about. Like, you know better type of thing. But um, it was really hard on my sister. And I didn't understand that at all until like a couple of years ago. Like I realized the depth of the shit that she went through for me and to help protect me and to, you know, make sure that I felt loved. And it makes me feel really guilty because I was oblivious for one, I was oblivious at the time. And for two, like, I have no idea how to help her or how to like help her heal that wound. Um, and I just want to make sure you like, she's okay because she's my lifeline. <laughs> she, like I would be nothing without her. I literally cannot live without my sister. So, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting just to kind of see other people's families acting normally. And also when I started asking questions to my mom about okay. what was going on, that was really interesting, um, because my mom's a heavy drinker, <laughs> um, and it didn't start like very abruptly or anything like that like she didn't just start like she didn't just become an alcoholic over the span of a year like she was just a casual drinker for like five years and then the next five years she was like more of a heavier drinker 
And then the five years after that, it was just like, wow, she's going through two giant bottles of white wine a day. And she can't afford those. So I was paying for those in high school, um, which is brutal trying to support your mom's addictions while you're just trying to graduate high school yourself. No kidding. I mean, the thing that I was thinking about too, is that like, so you were aware of these mental health issues right off the bat, kind of, you know, not right off the bat, but enough to where, well, I guess, were you, were you aware that you're, that you're like my own mental health issues? Well, your father that, that he had bipolar. I mean, was that a realization later or was that a realization then? I mean, well, it was something that I was always told about. Like when we started getting taken away from my dad, um, she would say, you know, your dad just gets really angry because he has bipolar disease and, you know, this is what it is and all this stuff. And then my sister started to kind of confirm it for me because it started, I started to not trust my mom for a, a couple of years. Actually, I hated my mom because she took me away from my dad and my dad and I were extremely close when I was little. Mm -hmm. Like I was daddy's girl for sure. And, um, so she kind of took me away from that and I resented her for it and I held her accountable for it. And then she tried to make up a lot of excuses. Well, your dad's, you know, unmotivated. He's, you know, um, just irrational all the time. He's just, you know, not safe to be around. And I was like, what are you talking about? How is it not safe for me to be around my dad? Like he is the one person that I feel the safest around. What are you talking about? And so I didn't understand that. Yes, she sort of meant like a physical sense of danger. Uh, My dad was having a birthday party for himself. And we have this cough. We had like one of those L shaped couches and um, behind the couch was like the dining room and in front of the couch was this coffee table and it was like a wood frame coffee table with glass in the center on the top and my dad got so rowdy and like so crazy with his friends they started wrestling and one of my dad's friends threw him over the couch and he landed in the middle of the glass coffee table and it just shattered everywhere and like I had just gotten up to get a glass of water and like go back in my room watch tv because I was just you know tired done dealing with their crap um because they had probably been horse playing around for hours so I just walked out and I saw that and I just like I was just like are you okay dad and he was like laughing his ass off he was like yeah I'm fine and just having a good time with his friends and I was like all right and then I just got my water and went back to bed and didn't even care about it because that was normal to be around for me and what age was that at that was probably like eight years old. So like, that's the type of physical kind of danger that I can see my mom was talking about. Um, but like when it comes to my dad being physically abusive towards me and my sister, absolutely not. He would never do that to us. He loves us way too much. Um, and once I started taking Taekwondo lessons, my dad started getting, you know, kind of afraid because I was kicking him so hard during our sparring. Cause he would spar with me every day. I would kick him so hard that he wouldn't be able to like walk on the boats at work because his legs would be so bruised. And that's not an exaggeration. Like he would be really messed up. So um, that's also like kind of part of why I wasn't afraid like of any physical danger from that sense. But um, that's just funny. So she kept like saying your dad's dangerous to be around. He's not safe to be around. And she later on, I realized she was referring to the, um, the verbal abuse like the guilt tripping and all that stuff my dad is a master guilt tripper and um he's very all about family and everything but he kind of uses that to make us feel bad for wanting to like be out and live our lives and even now like it's hard because he just wants to be so close and do all these things with us and he wants to talk with us on the phone every day and I'm like dad I can't do that like I've got so many things going on um, I can barely talk to my own friends and like the people that I'm literally around all the time. I can barely talk to them every day because of how much is going on in my life right now. And so that causes kind of a divide between us now because he doesn't understand why I'm so busy because he's just used to, you know, working when he wants to and dealing with that. But I can't do that because I was not set up for that. 
no, I mean, that is hard, right? Because it's like your family is supposed to be able to talk to all the time. And then like that goes into a whole different thing where it's like, you want to be, you want to have conversations. You want to be able to answer those phone calls because it's like, that's not always like going to be there. Like I love him and I think about him and stuff, but then again, when we get on the phone, he wants to talk for hours and hours. And mm-hmm. I don't want to sit on the phone for hours and hours. I want to check on him, see what he's doing. Maybe have like a good 15, 20 minute conversation, you know, but it's just, it drags on. And I feel like I can't escape because it's just mm-hmm. like, where is the end? You know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. I love if, the death, that's good. So, um, if so your relationship with your dad, I mean, would you say that that's, that is a better relationship and more, I don't know if quantifiable is the right word, but like than your mother. Oh yeah. 1000%. And do you think it's so obviously we don't know everything, but like, do you think that because your mother, you, you felt like she was telling you lies at that time, you know, was that like a big reason why you like kind of chose your dad more to certain things and trusted him more? Yeah. Um, also like, I don't know why, but like, I just started just believing everything my dad was saying. Um, just because like the way I think it's partially because our brains kind of work the same. Like my dad and I are both math engineering nerds my mom my sister are both kind of book nerds so um I think it was more so just like the way he explained things to me it really just made sense and his ideology behind everything I really understood and took to and when she tried to explain things to me I was kind of confused and I saw like gray spaces and like kind of missing areas um and also like my mom's alcoholism, like I would ask her the same question at different times, whether she was sober or not. And the answers were change every single time. So it's like, that's another thing too, is like, how can I trust you when you're giving me different answers? And my dad's answer is the same. And so I would just go to my sister and be like, mom and dad are telling me two completely different things. Like I need your help. I'm freaking out here. Like what's going on? So my sister was really just that um, stability for me, really just that foundation that I could rely on all the time honestly yeah so with with their with their mental health issues that they obviously both had you know is there something that back then told you like hey this isn't normal especially so like you described I want to go back to that because you described when you went over to your friend's house you're like oh this isn't normal Mm -hmm. right and like what a clarifying moment there because you're like hmm okay this is not normal so I mean did you go like after that was happening did you kind of go back and like ever bring that up to you know your parents or just like how did you use that as um not necessarily as an escape but as something that like you're like okay I'm understanding more now um Well, I think that it was mainly, it was mainly just like me going out and about and really experiencing other people's families to see for myself and open my eyes like, wow, this is not normal. Um, But from like watching TV shows and everything, like that's impossible to tell because everything's staged, everything's fake and blah, blah, blah. You already expect it to be fake. So even if like something does resonate with you, you're like, well, is that how it really is in the real world? So um, going to friends' houses was really like that confirmation for me. And also like I had a lot of, um, I had a big variety of friends that I was going to like just hang out for maybe just one or two times, but like soccer teams, um, after school clubs and all that stuff. Like I said, I was like really into engineering and stuff. So I was in a robotics club for a little bit, made a lot of friends there. um, And I would just, you know, go to all these different people's houses and like, be around all these different people at, you know, family gatherings, um, barbecues, birthday parties, and just see how different everybody was and how everybody was interacting with each other. And um, even just like hearing my friends' stories of like rough times they have in their family, that was like a really big shock to me because they, um, I had this one friend that was telling me about a hard time her family was having because they wouldn't let her go to this um camp or something 
that her family could well afford, but they just like didn't want her to go um, for some reason, I don't remember. And I just remember being like, your family can afford it and they're not letting you go. The reason I can't go to camps is because we can't afford it. <laughs> like, <laughs> my mom wanted me to try and go for like every and any opportunity I could if it was free. So it's like, that was a huge shock. And I wish that I could have been in their shoes. Like I was constantly jealous of all these kids because they had so much money and they were bringing to school all these fancy brand new backpacks and like brand new school supplies and like the five-star notebooks that were super nice. And I was literally bringing reusable school supplies from the year before. Like my binders were already ripped because it probably was my third or fourth year using them or it was like backup for my sisters and hand-me-downs and stuff like that. So um, that was a really big um, shock. And I also forgot the other part of your question. <laughs> well, no, I, th I think you answered it. I mean, that was, uh, um, I was you know, something I, too, but I, I got off track and I forgot, <laughs> you know, I never realized that like, you know, like you said, like money played such a big role in that too. You know, you got so used to being able to, um, oh, ooh, I remember, um, yeah. you asked if I like ever brought that back to my parents and asked them about it too, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think I did. I think there may have been a couple of times where I was like, well, you know, why can't I do this? Like everybody's out and going to doing this. Like, oh, um, actually I do remember one time I really wanted to ride the Maui bus to the mall with some of my friends because they do this all the time on the regular, their mom doesn't care. But my mom was like, you can't ride the bus. Like it's dirty. It's gross. Like, you know, you shouldn't be on there by yourself. Like you're a little girl, you're a little blonde girl. Like somebody's going to kidnap you. And so I was like fearless though. I was like, I do not care. Like I'm with a group of my friends that know damn well how to navigate this island. Like I feel completely fine. Um, and the bus ride was like $2. So I finally convinced her to uh, let me go. But it was just like, I brought up, I was like, why am I not allowed to do this? Like I'm the same age as all the other girls. Like literally it's the same circumstance. I haven't gotten, I haven't done anything wrong. Like I've done all my chore, all my chores. I don't have anything to do. I'm just sitting here bored and I can't play with my friends because they're all going to the mall. So yeah, it was like, what the heck? Why aren't you this? There's no reason you should be saying no. And my mom did that a lot too. Like she would say no, just because she could. She had no reason for it. No, she would just say no. And if I asked her why, she said, because I said so. And if I asked any further than that, I got a wooden spoon to the ass. <laughs> yeah. It was, there was no arguing or questioning any further. It was just no and done. Mm. You know, I think you're such an independent, you know, woman like you are. And I think that you've, you've have come a very long way from obviously your childhood right because like when I met you you were always so like these are all compliments like not none of this is supposed to be bad like like self-reliant and um you were yeah and you were smart and like you were confident about like who you're talking to and what you're talking about and you know you, you know and to like especially with that I just want to say like I typically tend to not say anything if I don't know the crowd or if I don't know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. like, I will not try and try and butt in on something that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But if I do and I'm confident in it, you'll know. So <laughs> and then you go, and it's true. Yeah. There's multiple conversations that I remember you, me and Colby and our friends had on the buses and stuff like that. And that's like the earliest rem memories that I yes, have of that's, that's just the one memory I have of freshman year is all of us on the bus constantly. Yeah. So it was really interesting to me because hearing about those stories, especially about your mother and stuff, it's like, it's really interesting because it's like, you are independent in what you're doing and you're always like looking for a reason why, like, there's kind of like, when it comes to mind, like, I feel like you are looking for a reason why you can't, like, it's never like, no, I can't do this because of this. It's always like, well, why, why are they saying I can't do this? Cause I can do it because of this or this or this or this, like you always are looking for something like that. And like, I've always appreciated that about you. Thank you. 
so it, so it's very contrasting. So what, so this might've been that answer, but like, what's kind of your earliest memory, your earliest memory of like realizing and becoming aware and trying to understand like your parents and like yeah. how they did things. Um, I think it was kind of, um, this is going to be a really weird story and kind of will be confusing for as far as like relevance, but just trust me. Um, I was in fifth grade and we had this project, um, shout out to Mr. Thorpe, greatest fifth grade teacher of all time. He was also my sister's fifth grade teacher. He was just awesome. Um, and we had this project where we had to build some sort of solar powered um, thing to cook a food object. And so people were doing like pizzas and like trying to do like some crazy stuff like pop tarts and um, little random stuff. And I decided to do hot dogs with like this super cool, like, I don't even know how we made it. My dad helped me make it and <laughs> all parents helped make their kids projects, but um, like it was allowed, but we, we took like this box and cut like a V shape into it and put like these two like foil sheets. And then we had a skewer in the middle and like we were spinning it from the outside and like we enclosed the whole thing. And um, I remember like spending a couple hours on that project with my dad, just like having a super good time. And I brought it back home to my mom's house over the weekend because school was next day and I spent the week with my mom and she was looking at it like, what the fuck is this? Like he couldn't, I thought he was going to help you with your project. Like this, you're going to get a bad grade. Like da, da, da. And another thing about my mom is she was very adamant on me getting A's and B's only. And if I got a B, it was like, all right, like you need to be home doing your homework, trying to get it up to an A, which is weird because if you know me in high school, I kind of said, fuck it and you know b's and c's are okay and because they didn't have access to see my grades or anything so i just kind of hit it but anyways um so she was just basically downgrading my project and just saying all this bad stuff about it and i was like wow maybe i shouldn't bring it maybe i should like try and make something else but i had nothing no time and nothing to make anything out of so I just took the project with me to school and I sold, like we had fake cash to use. I sold the most food out of everybody. My project was the best in the entire class, like voted the best. And like my dad got a call from my teacher, like about how awesome it was and everything. And they had already known each other too. But um, like they were talking about it and they were like, yeah, like it did great. Like she literally had a line around everybody's projects for people waiting for hot dogs and all this stuff and my dad was ecstatic and I took that home and told that to my mom and she was livid she was so pissed and that right there was just kind of like wow okay maybe maybe my mom's not right about everything and maybe my dad does know what he's doing you know um and I think that's kind of where my tipping point was and that's where I started to really not trust my mom anymore and I was just like you know what we're going to start taking things into consideration for ourselves and stop just listening to everything you tell me. <laughs> yeah. So, so like you said now, so when you moved from um, Hawaii to Idaho, mm -hmm. you were living with your mom right away. Correct. And so Let's go to that. So supporting your mom during high school, you said you bought her, her alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a big shock to a lot of people, which again, building up from everything I'd already been through, that was just like, just like another little thing on the to-do list. Like didn't really mean much, but um, yeah, my mom and I were in kind of a rough spot. She was struggling to find work and um she had work for like, she was a broker's assistant pretty much. So working in like home loans and that type of stuff, but she started working from home. Um, and that allowed her to kind of just start drinking uncontrollably whenever she wanted to. Um, and so she lost her job or got laid off from her job and she couldn't find work for a long time. That's around when I started working. I was about 16. Um, 
I still remember I got my job at the Croc Center. I was a lifeguard. I remember that. I remember when you worked there. It was a fun experience for sure. Like to be a lifeguard, go through the training and, you know, do the pool training and everything. Like it was a lot of fun. Um, Especially because like moving from Maui, I didn't really have, you know, the the beach anymore. So getting that extra aquatic, you know, activity during the winter was awesome. But um, it fucking sucked. That job sucks. (laughs) It didn't (laughs) didn't pay well enough. Like they tried to work us way too much when we were in high school. It was brutal. But um, when I started working there and I started getting a paycheck, I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is awesome. Like I was getting paid a decent amount. I was making like $500 checks. And um, I was like, sweet. Like I I get to start saving this for myself or so I thought. And so my mother, because she was out of work, excuse me, because she was out of work, um, she started asking me, hey, can I borrow 20 bucks for gas? Hey, can I borrow 20 bucks for beer? Hey, can I borrow 20 bucks for wine? Hey, do you want to go pick us up some Taco Bell without giving me any money or anything like that? So I just had to pay for it. She would just send me a list of what she wanted. And um, then we got a truck, finally. A very, very crappy truck to drive around. And she couldn't afford the car insurance for the truck. So I had to pay the car insurance. And I... um, had to pay for some of her overdue credit card bills and you know groceries and shampoo and conditioner and some makeup for her because she was literally the biggest just I don't even know what the word is for this but my mom would not go anywhere unless she looked absolutely perfect to her standards so like I could wake up in sweatpants and a sweatshirt and I could get in the car and go to McDonald's and get a breakfast sandwich or something, or like, you know, go to the grocery store and like pick up a few things for breakfast. My mom would have to put on a full outfit, do a full face of makeup, like get her hair done and everything just to leave the house. And um, so it was like, when she started running out of her products and everything that she had a million bottles of that she had just saved and hoarded over time. I'm literally not kidding. We had moved tubs of her products with us from Maui. Tubs, like storage bins, tubs of products. It was ridiculous. Um, But when she started running out of like makeup and products, we were at Ulta spending like $150 to $200 on products on her credit card bill. And then we would come around to the next month and she couldn't afford a credit card bill. So I'd be paying for all that stuff. And she said that she was going to pay me back and never did. So to this day, my mom, she doesn't even, she won't even admit that she owes me all this money either. That's the funny part. Um, My mom probably owes me around five grand at least. Probably upwards of 10 to 15, but I'm just going to say five because that's how much I know she owes me. So um, it sucked. (laughs) Wow. It's so Every one of my paychecks is going to my mom, except for like maybe 50 bucks for gas for my own car. That had to be hard. I mean, the other thing is too, huh? Which I saved up to buy. Do you remember my bug? Mm -hmm. When I first got that? Yeah. The only reason I got that car was because, um, because I couldn't save up literally any money for myself. Oh, and another thing is that the shitty truck we had, she started to say that I wasn't allowed to drive it anymore. And that was one of her things. We're like, oh, no, you can't take it because what if I need it? It was like, you don't go anywhere. <laughs> why, would you, why would you need it? Why can't I go to my friend's house? But so, yeah, um, I, I actually ended up reaching out to my grandma, my dad's mom, and asking her if she could loan me $2,000 to buy my first car. It was my friend's parents' um, sub bug, Volkswagen Beetle. It was a 2001 um and it was a five-speed manual it was my the best little car i've ever had i love that thing so much. and it's a it nice brand it was it was really nice it was great but um and the deal was that i could pay my grandma back because i didn't have that money so she fronted me the cash and then i paid her back like a loan um because i wasn't able to save any money for myself or anything like that so i had to hide money from my checks to be able to afford the registration be able to afford the insurance and all that um 
and I had to literally tell her, like, I would get in arguments about with her about why I couldn't buy her alcohol because I had to pay for gas to get to school because we didn't even live near a bus route. So it was like, that wasn't an option. And I'm not walking 45 minutes and 15 degrees to go to school. So <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep $50 of my check to, you know, maybe grab Taco Bell at lunch every couple days and to, you know, put gas in my car. So, I mean, let's, it's amazing to me because think about your childhood just in general. And then now on top of that, you now, you had to grow up so fast. You had to take care of you when you were 15 and your mom, like, and your mom. And like, so the responsibility that you had is insane. I mean, and it's funny to think, it's funny to hear that too, because like, to me, I don't think I grew up fast at all. Like, I feel like, you know, I feel good about my childhood. I feel like, you know, I got to have my fun and everything and you know, now it's game time. Now it's time to, you know, grind it out, figure out what I'm doing with my life, figure out how to set myself up for passive income in the future and Mm -hmm. retire happy and be able to do what I want to do. So, um, I think it's what helped me grow up so much was, honestly kind of being aware of the fact that if I don't get my shit together and come up with a plan I'm gonna end up like my parents struggling for the rest of my life and I do not want that like that is the one thing that I have put in the back of my mind in the back of my mind to keep me motivated is that I don't want to end up like my parents so I'm gonna get my ass up today I'm gonna get to work on time I'm gonna do what I have to do there. I'm going to get home, going to do my chapters and I'm going to get my real estate license and I'm going to, you know, set all this stuff up for me and I'm going to do it myself too. Like that's the biggest thing is yep. funny to remember that I've done this, all of this majority without my parents' help. So it's, it's hard to stop and think about it because I'm always so go, go, go. But um, you're absolutely right. I did grow up really fast, but it just doesn't feel like that. Which I, I mean, I would argue that like, that's a good thing, right? I mean, you, you definitely had your experiences in high school and lived and did whatever you wanted to do for the most part, which is my experiences in high school. <laughs> <laughs> but like, to me, you know, it's interesting too, because from my eyes, you've always been a hard worker. Thank like you, you you're always really like really book smart in school. You're always being able to do stuff. I mean, <laughs> I can, but yeah, you, you carried me through geometry like like oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that and like, but then, yeah, like I was just I was a math nerd and you helped me a lot in um English like you carried me through I think it was junior English pretty much that doesn't seem right but maybe it was I don't know in the senior year too that was like it was more more sort of like our little group effort we kind of all like just yeah did our- bare minimum effort to yeah we all yeah for sure but yeah so you were always hard working and you were always um independent and doing what you wanted to do I mean that was like a big thing and I remember like Colby and I we are my friend would always have conversations about that and um it was always good yeah it it was always good things like that because it was just we we just knew we were like she's gonna do whatever she wants to do (laughs) like she's gonna get it done like and so so thank you and, and so for me seeing this now, like, like I said, like, you know, it seemed like you grew up fast, but in reality, I mean, you did and you didn't. And like, that's great that you didn't necessarily feel like that, but mm-hmm. wow. I mean, do you, so there's gotta be, like you said, you, I think, okay. I think a lot of people our age um, think like this as well, but we want to break the mold of what our parents did. And like in your instance, it's, it's a lot of, you know, um, mental and physical and just all of that for parenting and and just your life. Right. And then for me, it's just like a lot more of like breaking the mold of, you know, money or this and that. So it's very different, but we all have that one thing in common where we want to, we want to stop what our parents and what their parents are doing and graduate up. So, I mean, those lessons, what a great motivator, right? Like, like you said, you wake up and you're like, Oh, I don't really want to go to this job, but you're like, no, I'm going to do it because they yeah. didn't, you know? Exactly. That's so, probably um, the biggest reason why I haven't like let myself just sit back and not do anything. Mm-hmm. 
is just because like there is no other option. <laughs> I will end up homeless if I don't get up off my ass and do this. Like I do not have support other than myself. So, um, well, to the most part. Yes. Support, yeah. Yeah. Thank God. But <laughs> yeah. But so what's the, what's the, just quickly touch on the relationship between you and your mom, because I, I, I was listening to this podcast and this reminded me of what we were going to kind of talk about. And so I wrote it down, but it says, when you look at forgiveness, it doesn't excuse the other person for their behavior. It just exits you from carrying it, which I loved because yeah. it's basically saying that forgiveness is not making excuses for that other person, what their actions did. Um, it's just letting go of it from your point of view. And so yeah. I want to touch on that, obviously, with your mom, because there's a lot of pent up stuff there. I mean, not pent up, but like just a lot of stuff there in general. So, I mean, have you thought about that? Have you guys have you forgave her before? And then she did it again or whatever it may be. I mean, yeah. um, so I actually have I actually did reach out to my mom recently. Um, it was probably right around Christmas. I got a card from her and it had her new phone number on it. So I called her um, or no, I had texted her and just kind of talked to her like, hey, and just gave her the space to say anything she had to say, kind of like a test just to see like, hey, do you even know what you did to me? Do you even know why I haven't talked to you for the last few years? Um, and she had no clue. She was completely oblivious. Um, I'm, it's really sad to say this too, but I'm pretty sure my mom's on drugs now. Um, just the way that she is, she gained a lot of weight while we were over here and she's really super skinny out of nowhere. Just eye sockets sunk in, doesn't look good. And, um, cause I know what my mom used to look like and what she looks like now, it's not a healthy version of herself. And I know who she's newly dating and he's also not a great judge of character. So um, it's really sad to like see that, honestly. And I completely forgot where I was going with that. Shoot. Um, <laughs> what did you just ask me? What was I just talking about? I was asking about forgiveness. Like if you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, wow. Shoot. My brain. <laughs> and I haven't even smoked that much. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I kind of talked to her and she didn't really acknowledge anything. She was just sending me a lot of random pictures about her current life, um, where she was staying, some of her new friends, um, just really weird, completely random. And she wasn't even really acknowledging anything I was saying to her. So um, I flipped out. I was like, you really like, why won't you take accountability for what happened? Like, why won't you even talk about it to me? Like, I can't let this go until we can at least, you know, talk about it until I can hear what you have to say about this, because this is, this is not okay to me. And um, she basically told me that my feelings were wrong and that I was making a lot of this up and which is crazy to believe because I have witnesses to what happened. So um, for her to say that it was made up was just, okay, why are you trying to mm -hmm. completely erase that? Because it happened and it's not just going to be forgotten about. Um, so yeah, she just tried to completely swipe it under the rug and act like nothing happened. And that was not okay to me. And so basically I forgive her for the actual incident itself. I don't care about it anymore. It happened years ago. Um, which I'm not really going to say because it's just kind of too personal, but, um, for how she recently acted and for how like she's currently acting, just not taking accountability at all. Um, I don't forgive that at all. I think that's not okay. And I think that she needs to act like an adult because she is one and, um, she needs to be able to talk to me about what she did wrong and admit what she did wrong. And I think that she has such this egotistical mentality of everything I think is right and nothing I ever do is wrong, that she just won't do that. 
So it's really sad um, because I do like if she were to give me a genuine apology and like to fess up to everything, then I would forgive her and I would have her back in my life. But I just know that that's not going to happen. Yeah. So it's really sad. No, it is. Yeah. I mean, how important that would be for you and how um, how important it'd be for her as well. I mean, you know, obviously yeah. we don't know, but I think that would like be. She's not going to be able to be a part of my life at all. And she doesn't care. <laughs> she doesn't care to try to fix it. And she hasn't for the last almost four years. So, I mean, to each their own. You do you all to me. <laughs> I'm doing fine without you. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what are some lessons then that you've taken away from them from childhood to now to this moment? I mean, there's got to be something that you kind of, I want to know some lessons that you've learned that you're like, okay, these are things that I've learned that is going to help me out with life. And then I want to know the other thing too, which would be um, what you plan on implementing when you have kids as well. And you want to start growing a family. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think the biggest thing I learned is to not put your parents on a pedestal, um, for one, for two, just to, what do you mean by that? Realize, oh, uh, not putting my parents on a pedestal. So not thinking that they're just perfect. Not thinking that everything they do is right because they're, they make mistakes. They're human. Um, we're all imperfect. We're all going to have, you know, opinions, and whatnot and sometimes those aren't right so just to have like a mind of your own um for two oh shoot no come back to me what was it i just i just thought about it <laughs> oh no don't do this to me brain but onto the other question that you asked about the kids and everything i yeah. actually don't want to have kids okay um, and i think part of that is because of the childhood that i went through um, I used to want to have kids when I was younger because I wanted to be so adamant on, I'm going to teach them, you know, the right way to do this. I'm not going to do this to them. I'm not going to do what my parents did to me sort of thing. But the more I get older, the more I realize every parent says that every parent says, well, I just don't want them to end up, or I just don't want them to how to be how my parents treated me. And, um, then it just kind of turns into this like circulating loop of parents saying, oh, I did my best. Oh, I did my best. So um, yeah, I just, I, I don't wanna have all of that weight on my shoulders. I wanna be financially more free from that. And I consider my animals, my babies. So <laughs> that's a big part of it. There I'm just go. gonna have a shit ton of animals. That works, you know. I feel like you might. Who's being a brat? <laughs> this is Ophelia, my lovely, almost two-year-old. Oh, Ophelia. Dad. He's very, very cute. He tests my patience every single day, but I love him. The kids do that too. <laughs> I'm sorry. Missy, hi. She's like, no, I just want to go. <laughs> no. Well, Tasha, I want to acknowledge you because it's extremely brave for sharing everything that you have shared and like everything that you went through as well. And like, I don't want that to go unnoticed because like it's a I think this podcast, I'm hoping this podcast will be able to help and resonate with other people that go through kind of the same things, you know. Um, yeah. So I just want to thank you for sharing everything that you've shared. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm really glad that I could kind of like share and get my space to kind of share it too. Because um, one is it just, it's just offering more closure for me. Mm -hmm. um, and two, I really do want to try and help somebody with this information. Like, yeah, um, you do not have to let your parents hold you down. And I think that that's one thing that I really learned um, as I was getting older too, is that I was so worried about the right school to go to because my mom was on my ass about getting into Stanford or getting into that stuff and how, you know, a state college would just not be okay. And that I had to go to somewhere, you know, exquisite. Otherwise I wasn't doing my best. 
And um, I think a lot of those opinions, I really hold held on to myself and kind of let dictate what I was doing and that certain jobs weren't going to be worth it, even if I just thought they were going to be fun, but because the pay wasn't well enough. Mm-hmm. And so um, that kind of really cut out a lot of experiences I could have had because I was so worried about what my parents thought. So um, being able to get out of that environment from a young age, really, it forced me to grow up faster. Yes, but it also allowed me to finally be able to figure out what I wanted to do with no other outside opinions trying to force me in the right or wrong direction. And it was really just me figuring it out for myself. So that was a big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you did. I remembered remembered it. (laughs) Go for it. Yeah. No, that was it. Oh, that was it. Yes. (laughs) Perfect. Great. Well, perfect. You, Tasha, made it. I think our, I think our conversation was excellent. And I think, um, I mean, was there anything that we kind of didn't cover that you wanted to go over? Um, on the spot, not really. Um, I just want to remind everybody to do your best to be kind to people because you have no idea what they're going through, um, except for when they're driving slow on the road. Get the hell over on the right lane. I don't know what you're doing. I'm testing my patience. Um, and yeah, just be kind to people and have a good day. That works perfect. Well, there's three questions at the end of the podcast. You know how this works. You, just, you listen. Um, so are you ready for these three grand questions? I'm nervous. I have no idea what I said in the other video. (laughs) Let's do it. All right. Number one, what is a daily habit that has changed your life? (laughs) Can I say this on the podcast? (laughs) You say whatever you want on the podcast. Uh, Well, there's a couple that have daily habits that have changed my life. Um. The one I'm going to say, everybody that knows me is already anticipating, (laughs) but the re and it's very controversial, um, to some, I feel like as time goes on, it's less controversial, but Mm -hmm. to each their own, um, I am a daily stoner. I smoke weed every single day. Uh, I use it for many different reasons. I use it for my appetite. I use it for sleep. I use it for my knee and my back problems. Um, just for a lot of different things, but I, did have a very bad season where that was kind of, I was using it as a crutch and just kind of like falling into this poor me, poor me thing where I was just like too tired, unmotivated. And, um, it kind of got a hold of me for a little bit there. And I was struggling for a while. And I kind of talked to you about this a little bit recently, but, um, so I just wanted to like, advise that if you are using cannabis as like a tool to help you out um to just really be on track of it and to not let it you know just deter you because it's really easy to just you know want to smoke all day and relax and do whatever but um you got to get your stuff done so i feel like yes it's a great tool but it's a very tricky tool to use because it can become a very easy distraction yes yes Okay. Number two. I'm I'm pretty confident that was my answer in the last one too. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Number, well, I didn't ask these questions in uh, the first season. No, No, I came up with these afterwards because I wanted to do something like this. So number two, how would you consider your purpose in life right now? What, What was the question? How would you consider your purpose in life right now? What do you mean consider my purpose? Like how, like, what would you say your purpose in life right now is? Oh, um, I'd say from like my own standpoint, like what I, okay. Um, I'd say my purpose is really to build my foundation for the rest of my life. Um, I know that what I'm going for right now, as far as a job may not be what I want to stick with for the rest of my life. But um, I know that it will build a really good foundation to give me the opportunities to do other things if I want to, and just to kind of explore. So uh, I think my purpose is really just focusing on getting a solid foundation 
to be able to live my life how I want to live it. That's all I've been focused on for like the last year. So <laughs> I like that answer. That's a good answer. Number three, last one. What's something you know that you wish other people knew or understand? Hmm. That's a hard one. I can go a lot of different ways with this. There's a lot of stuff I wish people knew. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, Seriously, though, there is. Mm, I'd probably say I wish people knew how to better accept and understand or better comprehend, I should say, other people's emotions. Um, Wow. And that's, that's kind of a broad one at first to say, but more specifically, I mean, like when you're talking to somebody and you're trying to explain something to them, because I have this problem personally with a lot of people, because everybody thinks that um, when I'm talking to them, because I'm not using an excessive amount of emojis that I'm mad at them or something. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not mad at all. I'm not upset or anything. Like I have a smile on my face right now. I don't know what you're, what you're talking about. Um, but, and also like, it goes the other way too. Like when somebody's upset and they're trying to communicate that to somebody else, if they don't really understand, um, why they're feeling that way, they get really defensive and really hurt. And they almost take it like personally, even though it may not be that way. So, um, and I hate social media for that because I feel like a big part of social media has just like pulled us away from face-to-face interactions where we can really just feel comfortable talking to people um, and feel comfortable being upfront and honest and have to apologize for everything or worry about offending somebody. Which, I mean, yes, you should be worried about offending people, but um, not when it's like talking about just regular everyday stuff. And yeah. they're just, you know, getting butt hurt over just one simple reply. So I just wish we could understand each other better. Um, some people have a real hard time. You know, some people are literally like, like me, have social anxiety. Um, They just have a hard time talking to people and they just keep conversations short and limited. Like a lot of the people that I clean for, I feel bad because I feel like they maybe think that I'm just uninterested or just don't care about what they're talking about, which no, that's not the case. But when I'm put on the spot like that, I just don't know what to say. And so I'll be like responding with one or two word quick responses. Yeah. And then back about it later and I overthink and I'm like shit she probably thought I was mad at her she probably thought I didn't care because I wasn't like talking to her or anything and it's just like no I'm just anxious so um yeah just stuff like that really yeah no that's a great message though I appreciate that Tasha thank you for coming on here and being on again Absolutely. reoccurring episode you know right. it was you and Claire both got reoccurring so that's yeah. pretty special pretty special <laughs> no but uh females too Hmm? are we the only females too no there's one more i had rose oh okay that's right that's right. yep her, her episode was really good too so well, awesome thank you for having me um it's been a pleasure and i love doing these so much it's great to just be able to sit here and talk yeah i love it too other people are gonna see this and i know that but it just feels like we're talking <laughs> yeah that's all it is just conversation between you mm-hmm. perfect well thank you